All right. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you guys for coming today again. Um, so it seems like most of you have been able to get Quartus and whatnot working. So we're probably going to get started in the interest of time. Uh, if you haven't been able to get it working yet, that's fine. We're happy to work with you during lab hours to make sure you get set up and get you caught up on the stuff that we teach here. But for now, I guess just, I guess, pay close attention. We'll, we also have the slides posted and the lab spec is posted and various other resources that we will be using throughout DAV have been posted for your guys' convenience. But yeah, are you guys able to see over there? Yeah. Okay, I trust. So anyway, um, without further ado, we'll get started on Quartus, Questa, and Verilog. So as part of this workshop, we're going to be doing part zero of lab one together. Lab one has been posted in DAV links. Uh, the title should be something like cooking math or something. Don't worry about it. Um, if you haven't installed, oh, if you haven't gotten it installed yet, the um, instructions are also linked here. But anyway, so now we are going to start by creating a project. Some of you might have already done this if you were extra thorough with the instructions in the um, installation instruction slides. But if not, we're going to walk you through it right now. So the slides have instructions as well with like screenshots and whatnot, but we're just going to like screen share ourselves doing this. So I will open Cordis and hopefully it will actually run. This may take us a couple of years. That's so wild. It actually worked first try. Anyway, so to start, everyone, uh, to create a project, you're going to go, um, you're going to go to the file menu up here and click on new project wizard. You're going to see a menu that looks like this. Here, we're going to select a folder for our project. This stuff should hopefully be fairly intuitive, but we're walking through it for the sake of completeness. Um, let's go here and IEEE dav new folder workshop. All right, so you select a folder, uh, name there, you give your project a fun name. Doesn't really matter what it is, just something that's identifiable because it's going to be the name of your, uh, it's going to be the name of your like project file and also probably close to the name of your top level design entity, which is your like the module that actually call like instantiates all your other modules. So we will just call this uh, cooking math, and then the name for your top level design entity. Typically, the name of your top level should just be the same as your project name, but with top at the end for the sake of uh, consistency. So the next, you're going to select the type of project to create. Projects to create. We'll just create an empty project. And here it says, if you want, ask you if you want to add any files. We are not going to do this for now because we haven't created any files yet. So that'll come that'll come later. So here, this is where we actually like have a bunch of letters and numbers that we don't know the meaning of. So to start, um, we can make this a little bit bigger. And if you'll notice, we have a bunch of different FPGA model numbers down here. If any of you recall, last lecture, we specified a very specific FPGA model number that we'll be using in DAV, and we're going to select that here. It's going to be 10M50DAF484C7G, right here. You might have to scroll a bit to find it. Um, 10M50DAF484C7G. Is everyone good so far? All right, and then we're going to go next. Here, it's going to ask you to select your simulation tool, among other things. This is the only one we actually have to worry about. Uh, you can select Questa Intel FPGA or Questa Sim, depending on how you installed Questa to begin with. You should probably be selecting this one, but if it doesn't work, you can try the other one and just mix and match until one of the combinations works. We love Questa for that. Here, for under Formats, we're going to select System Verilog HDL. You could also select Verilog if, you're, um, if you don't want to use some of the fancy System Verilog features, but we do, so we're going to select this. And then you'll see a summary page, which you can just click finish, and it should create your project sometime in the next century. Cool. So if you followed along this far, you should have a screen that looks like this with your, um, with your top level entity name here, the FPGA model number, a bunch of buttons, and a blank gray screen. Now we need to actually create a Verilog file that will act as our top level, because though we've specified the name for our top level, we haven't created a tool file for it yet. So, 
Um, oh, I mean, gee, that's fair. We can probably call it what's actually in the lab spec. Yeah. Yeah, let's do that, actually. So we will um, create a file called mini ALU top SV, and then we'll just rename it to that because we probably should have done that to begin with. But yeah, so let's type something random in here and save it, and we'll save it as. Thank you, Claire, for catching that. All right, your turn. Okay, so now we're going to build our first module. You can kind of think of modules as functions, but not quite. Um, and you may see what that looks like later in the lab. Um, but when we're making our module, you usually want to call it whatever the file is called. So in this case, we're going to do, I like a type, I guess not. I'm still trying to I'm still trying to create a project. Oh, I yeah, we can it. pause a little bit so that everyone can have their project created. Sorry about that. Too long to find that train. Well, already. Okay. Um, resuming with the syntax, we're going to make something called a module, and so the you want to close it with an end module here. All right. So so far we've left this blank. Now in the spec, we specify that you want to take an input from switches, the switches on your board. Uh, if you go on your kit, you'll notice you have an actual FPGA in there and it comes with 10 switches. Um, above each of those switches is an LED. So we want to use the switches to control the LEDs. So in that case, I'll just name my two parameters, switches, LEDs, okay. Uh, you might notice that I put both the supposed input and output in the parameter section. And for the next step I'll do is tell uh, Fortis which one is my input and which one is my output and also what they look like. Um, so in my case, uh, because this is, I guess, just pure combinational, I'll just say input switches. Mm -hmm. I think it goes before. Hmm? It goes before the. It does. Just go here. Oh. Yeah, it does. Okay. Yeah, Verilog uses a slightly different syntax than everything else. So you notice I put it in the back accidentally. You're not supposed to do that. Um, to specify a 1D array, I will use this notation. And you might be familiar with the brackets, but inside you might notice that, oh, the numbers seem backwards. And why is that? It's different than normal indexing. Is when you read, uh, I'm going to use binary as an example, the first bit is the rightmost. So as you extend, you go towards the left. And that's why the notation for Verilog reflects this. Um, what I did by putting like brackets back here is if you want like a 2D array, you can do that, but we're not doing that for this. Um, lab. And then I can do the same thing for output. Uh, zero. Again. So now I've told it, okay, here's my input and here's my output. And I want my switches to directly control the LEDs. And it's probably easier or as easy as you think. Um, and we can just do. I want to show them the other syntax report. Definitions. Huh? Can we show them the other syntax for definitions as well? Going yeah. To directly in the header. Oh, yeah. Um, so what Prem is saying is the other way you can do this is you can actually just, uh, if I can do this correctly, like specify the ports directly in the parameters area. What's the difference between the notation you had before and this one? Should we put it directly in if there's any? Um, the one where you put it directly in the header is for in industry. But if you have a lot of them, then... Yeah, and if you put it in the like, header, you just remove it from the inside. Yeah, so it would just be like this, if I could. Yeah. Also, yeah, and also for the record, you can't mix and match them. You have to either... You have do to all. do one or the other. So then in my okay. case, and I would just do this. But as far as like declaring inputs and outputs, they have the same effect? They have the same effect, yes. Okay. I could do that. Um, Yeah, so uh, for now, because we're just doing pure combination, I believe, for lab one, uh, 
what a variable is essentially in Verilog is a wire. So uh, wires just mean that they don't, they're not able to change on like a clock or sequentially, which we'll cover later. Uh, but for now, if you want to make a wire, you could either like wire something, or in our case, we'll use the assign keyword, which is kind of the same thing because we already have our wire here. So uh, it's just as easy as sign these equals switches. Uh, where are my equals? Switch. Okay. Uh, I hope you can understand that. Do you have any questions so far? Can you explain again what does the bracket nine zero does? Right. So on our uh, FPGA, we have 10 um, like switches. Each of them will have one bit for them. So like on or off, for example. And we also have 10 LEDs uh, with the same uh, format. So we need 10 bits to represent the switches and then 10 bits to represent the LEDs. And we're able to store them in an array um, from like uh, nine to zero, or it will be like 10 bits. So you are assigning um, a pin to each of the switches and each of the LEDs? So basically what's happening here is we declare that these switches are a, basically a 10 bit number that is the input to our top level module. So this is going to come directly from the FPGA's inputs. So like these switches on the board. Yeah, it may help when we uh, pin plan. So you'll see how each of these directly translates to something on the board, but just know that we're essentially receiving a 10 bit number and outputting 10 bit number. Yeah. Does that make sense? So the assigned statement is basically taking your value of whatever your switch's 10 bit number is and then assigning that to your LEDs directly. So it's literally just connecting those two wires together. Evan. Is there a reason why we have uh, LEDs equal switches? Is, does it matter if it's swap? Uh, yes, because LEDs is the output, so that's yeah. what you're actually driving. So you want to take the stuff. input switches and assign it to the LED output. It's like variable syntax in any programming language where the thing on the left is the thing that's being assigned to, and the thing on the right is the thing that's providing the value. OK, it should be that easy. Did you want to do the Cuesta? Yeah, um, let's, let's do that. So anyway, how many of you actually did manage to have at least one member of your team get Cuesta working? OK, that's fairly significant. Um, so we will, we will continue with actually like working through using Cuesta. So in order to do that, we're going to write what's called a test bench, which is to say, basically, when we're using uh, when we're using simulation software, we have to write a module that is able to basically pretend to be our FPGA. And what that means is it's going to supply values for the switches, and we're going to see try to use our simulation software, Questa, to determine what the output values are, the, L the LEDs. So now what we're going to do is we're going to create, and we're going to save this first, and we're going to create a new module. Or, yeah, new module. File new, system Verilog HDL file. And we're going to call this one mini LU TB for test bench. Typically, when you create test benches, they end in TB. It's just good convention. This one doesn't need to have input or output ports. Um, and you can say end module. I think it doesn't need to have input or output ports. We'll find out soon enough. You might need output, but we can work out that later. Yeah, if Questa complains, we'll add an output. But for now, you don't need to specify anything up there. And now here's what we're going to do. Every test bench has a few key components that we'll need in order to Make it work. And the nice thing about test benches is that if you're familiar with any sort of regular programming, te writing test benches is very similar because there's a few uh, system Verilog constructs that allow us to basically sim like replicate regular like sequential or like line by line sort of code execution in a test in a simulation software. So the first thing we need to do is we need to tell Questa, the simulation software, what our time scale is, which is to say. How many nanoseconds of simulation correspond to like real time? So what we're going to do, we're going to keep it simple. And all, basically, all of your test benches will do this. You're going to add at the very top the, a little backtick and then time scale 1 ns slash 1 ns. This means time scale for your uh, simulation is, I believe, 1 nanosecond of simulation time per nanosecond of real time, something like that. And then in our test bench, we're going to write some code that will basically Sim, um, simulate the effects of changing the switches and seeing the output on the LEDs. So 
we have here our mini ALU top. This is the thing that we're trying to test, the uh, module that we're, um, the unit under test. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna instantiate this real quick. We'll just copy paste this header and we'll pass in switches and LEDs as wires that will be driven. So we can uh, we can define reg switches. You don't need to worry about what reg is yet. You'll um, understand it soon enough. But for now, just assume that reg is like a variable in a test bench. These need to be 10 bits each. So it'll go zero, zero. Oh, actually, since this is an output of the module, we can define it as a wire. But switches, since we're going to be changing it, like in our um, simulation, we will call it a reg. Anyway, so um, then to instantiate the module, you're going to use the syntax, which basically looks like this. You have your module name at the front. Then you add some sort of name for your instantiation. Typically in test benches, a common thing is to say UUT, which is unit under test. And then inside the parentheses, you will actually pass in your ports. Are there any questions so far about module instantiations, test benches, timescale, anything else? Cool. So now we have a test bench with switches that currently have no value, LEDs that are being driven by this module, and this module is actually instantiated. But now the problem is if we were to actually simulate this, nothing is going to happen because our switches have no value. So we need to actually define a value for our switches. Here's how we'll do that. So in Verilog, there's a few constructs we can use in test benches and also, oh shit, okay. <laughs> yeah? yeah? Back to your regularly scheduled programming. Sorry about that. We My computer almost died. We just plugged it back in. Anyway, so back to Verilog. The reason why you're all here. So now we have a test bench. It has switches. It has LEDs. It has a module. But it doesn't do anything because the switches don't have a value. So Verilog provides us with some constructs to actually define the value of the test of the regs that we define, both at the beginning and throughout the execution of the test bench. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with defining the value of the switches at the beginning. This is going to be in something called an initial begin block. So just write initial begin, write end, and then here inside here, we're going to set the switches to be some sort of value. We can just say zero. And if you want to actually like do it with the proper Verilog syntax to define a number, you would say 10 for the number of bits, an apostrophe, and then B for binary, and then zero. This is just saying that we're assigning a 10-bit binary number to our switches with the value zero, aka 10 zeros. Question. Oh, wait, why are the switches bred in the LEDs? Because the switches are being assigned in our initial begin and our um, other blocks. So they have to be a reg because that's just something that Verilog syntax requires. It, oh. where, meanwhile, the LEDs are a wire because the output of the module is driving them directly and combinationally. Yeah, you can think of begin and end as like the parentheses if you use uh, like C++. Um, just like if initial begin like and- Curly braces. Yeah, curly braces, so yeah. yeah. Um, because of course. Yeah. So anyway, we have this in our initial begin. Now we kind of have a choice here. So Verilog provides us with a couple different ways in which we can provide values to our regs throughout the execution of the test bench. One of these ways is just by like specifying more things in our initial begin, and then they will all execute sequentially. So if we want to do it that way, we can put in another statement in initial begin, um, say switches equals one, Like that, we can just keep going. And the problem here, though, is that if this like occurs sequentially, we're going to drive switches with zero and then immediately change it to one and then immediately change it to two, and we're not going to notice the difference. So what we need to do is we need to add a simulation delay, which is to say we need to tell simulation that we want you to hold the value of switches for some amount of time and then assign the next thing. So here we will go ahead and specify a simulation delay with a little hashtag sign and then the number 10 for 10 nanoseconds. If you look up here, our time scale of 1ns to 1ns, this is what determines like the length of our simulation delay. So 10 here just means 10 nanoseconds. And then we can do the same here. Another thing we can do, since we don't really want to type in every single 10-bit number into our initial begin block, is use a for loop, because Verilog actually does have for loops. And in hardware, they synthesize to um, something kind of complicated that you probably don't need to worry about. But you can think of them in hardware as just like 
expanding the contents of the for loop into a bunch of separate lines and then synthesizing whatever that generates. In this in this simulation, though, it's just going to run sequentially like a for loop in any programming language. So I wonder if I started recording again. I did. Anyway, so the syntax for a for loop is fairly standard. Um, we have to define an integer. This is just going to be our iteration variable. Verilog for whatever, or at least parts, I think. Or maybe it's Verilog. I don't know. Something makes us uh, define our like iteration variable outside of the actual for loop. So we're going to do that. So then for the actual for loop, we're going to go for parentheses i equals 0, i is less than, say, um, 10 bit number, and then i equals i plus 1. And then we're going to add a begin and end as our curly braces. And this is the syntax for a for loop. It's fairly straightforward. And then inside, what we're going to do, we will just add a 10 second delay and then update the value of switches. And then this will essentially replace this. Does all of this make sense so far? Any questions? Listen, when you put the, like, the 10 ones in binary, that's like, um, like, that's like in a nine twos complement, right? Um, it doesn't matter, frankly. It can be. Two's complement is all about what you're like interpreting your values as. But if we're just assigning literal values of high and low to wires, it doesn't really matter whether it's two's complement or not. Why yeah. don't you choose 10 bits instead of like numbers starting? It's because our switches have 10 bits in them. Jerry. What is the initial block for a event? So the initial block is basically just a block that will run at the very beginning of your uh, test bench. Or if you synthesize to hardware, it will run at the very beginning of your circuit's uh, execution, for lack of a better word. Sparsh. So if you just left, left this program to run, it would like. Uh, if you have this, which is like kind of the pattern of numbers and bi counting in binary. Yep, it'll just count up from zero all the way to the maximum 10 bit binary number. And then, yeah. And that's it. And then at the end, to actually tell our simulation to stop, we will use the stop directive. So this is one way of actually running a test bench. And we will actually run the test bench now. So we'll save this as mini ALUTB. And now since we're actually going ahead and simulating the test bench, which instantiates our top level module, we are going to set this as our top level entity. So right click the test bench in the files menu, which if you if, you, if it says hierarchy up there, you click on it and then ch change it to files. Right click this, set as top level entity. And then if you go back to hierarchy, you should see it says it's mini LUTB now. Now we're going to run analysis and synthesis, and hopefully it'll work first try. It'll take a little bit, hopefully. Why is it taking this long for a test bench of one wire? Oh, it works, possibly. No, nope, it doesn't. We need output. Ah, yeah. OK, so if you're getting this error, it's because Quartus is mad that our top partition doesn't contain any logic, which means that we need an output for this test bench, which is really stupid if you ask me, but apparently it's necessary for Questa to work. So we'll just output LEDs, and then we can make this not thing. You need the 19. Yeah. So you can just do that instead, and then this will hopefully work this time. Is anyone stuck so far, apart from the typical quest that doesn't work errors? Cool. Can you well, show yes. Is there any part of this that anyone doesn't understand? Okay. Questions, comments, jokes. Oh, Justin. Um, line nine. Yeah. So basically what's happening in line nine is we are instantiating our module, the mini ALU top that Claire made earlier. We are instantiating that in our test bench so that we can test it. So this entails like saying what the name of the module is, giving it a name so you didn't under test, wow. which is because we're testing it, and then passing in two ports, the switches and the LEDs. Anyway. If you'll now notice, 
this is green and there's a check mark here, which means our analysis and synthesis actually worked. So at this point, we're going to try running the simulation tool. If you can't um, actually do this part on your own computer, just follow along um, here, up here, pay attention, and then you can try this again on your own time with the recording and the slides. Anyway, um, hopefully my computer actually has it working because we've been using it for the last year. It, it'll run eventually. There we go. But yeah, so when you run RTL simulation, it should open the little feather icon down here that will soon change to a giant orange Q, right? There we go. Anyway, this is Questa. Welcome. You want to pull the slides again? Let's throw it to. This piece? Yeah. Cool. So, yeah, OK. So here's what we're going to do. First, in order to actually, like, we're going to have to actually simulate this test bench. So we're going to scroll up or down or wherever in this menu to where it says work, because writing Verilog is a lot of work. Anyway. Then click on mini ALU TV, which should show up here. If it doesn't show up, there are other issues and we need to fix them. But uh, and then right click and click simulate. You will notice that if you just double click the test bench, it will also simulate, but it'll simulate without showing you all of the ports, which is not what we want. So we will simulate and show all of the ports underneath. So we have to right click and click simulate ourselves. So now if you do that, you will see that we have this test bench. We have this uh, unit under test, which is our ALU, our, um, ALU thing that Claire made so far. And what we're going to do is we need to add some waveforms to our giant black screen over here. So just click on LEDs and switches over here and Control W, or you can right click and add wave right here. So this should show up here now. And now what we can do in order to make sure that this module works is in order, we actually have to run the test bench, which will entail finding this button right here next to where it says 100 nanoseconds. And you can click Run, and that will run the test bench for exactly 100 nanoseconds and then pause. Does everyone follow along so far? No, can you repeat that? It's like okay. Clicking on work. Yeah, so after clicking on Work, it's going to open. Um, you click on the test bench module, and or you right click, and then you click on Simulate. And then that will open this screen right here with the test bench up here some ports here. You just click on each of the ports that you want. Uh, you can shift click to select multiple. And then you right click, add wave. And then they'll show up in this menu. What do we need to do for the TV to up in the way, right? Um, that usually means there's some sort of syntax error preventing it from showing up. Uh, we can take a look at it after we're done here. So. Yeah, at this point, you should see this. If you are um, if you have Questa open, you did all that so far. You should see your two uh, ports right here. What we're going to do, we, we are trying to verify that our module, which basically just assigns the switches to the LEDs, we're trying to verify that at every, at every given value of switches, the LEDs are the same as what we passed in for the switches. So we will start by just running the module for 100 nanoseconds. And we should see a bunch of little things in green up here. What these are, these are the waveforms. Um, this is providing us a value in hex for the actual switch value, and then down here, or for the LED value and the corresponding switch. I'll switch the two in order so you can see the input first. So this is our input, the switches. This is our output, the LEDs. And as you can see, so far, all of the values are the same, which is what we want. So this is good, but there are a couple other things that Questa allows us to do in order to verify that our things are working to a satisfactory degree. So if we want to verify that the numbers are actually correct in binary, we right click, click on Radix right here, or um, hover over it. And then you'll see a bunch of different options here. You have symbolic, which I don't know what that does, binary, uh, self-explanatory, octal, decimal, unsigned, hexadecimal, ASCII, et cetera. What, the, what we're going to do here is we can select binary, and this will change all of the numbers up there to show up in binary instead of hex. And if we now, like, if we zoom in with the I button, with the I key, we can actually see our full like number value. We can do the same for the LEDs, radix, binary, and we can see that they all match. Any questions so far? 
Okay. Another thing we can do that is a really powerful feature in Questa is the ability to actually change the value of our inputs at will. So we have the option right now to, I'm gonna run this for another like five nanoseconds. So at this point, we're like halfway into the 10 nanosecond period for one of these values. This it looks like the value 1010, which is 10. Um, so what we're gonna do, we're actually gonna tell Questa to just change the value of switches arbitrarily, and we're gonna see what LEDs does to react to it. So if you right-click switches again in the waveform, then you go down to where it says force. You can choose your own arbitrary value for switches and pass it in as an input. So we'll say we want to change it to, I don't know, 1010. We can change it to that. And then there's a couple of different options you have here. Uh, we're going to typically use deposit because it's the least like obtrusive. But what it basically does is deposit is going to change the value of our the thing that we're changing the value of. And then it's going to leave it like that until our circuit changes the value of it again. So in this case, it'll leave it for like five nanoseconds, and then the test bench will change it to whatever the next value was supposed to be. In, uh, in contrast, we also have freeze, which is going to change the value and then just hold it as that value forever. So the test bench can't change it. Our, um, our FPGA won't be able to change it if we're simulating an actual like hardware module. And like... This is just going to freeze that value there. So it's useful if you want to like test something over an extended period of time with a bunch of different uh, other things also being changed. So we're typically going to use deposit. I don't actually know what drive does. Um, we're just going to use deposit here. And if we now delay for another five nanoseconds, we should see that this has deposited the value of alternating ones and zeros, and the LEDs have reacted accordingly. And then if we yeah. click on this again, it looks like the test bench has responded to that and updated it to be whatever the next value in the sequence is. So that number plus one. And it's as if we, um, it's as it's currently back in control of the, by the test bench and not our deposited value. Do note though, that when we deposit a value, it does change the state, like the internal simulation state of our module. So when we change this from say 10 to, a thousand. It doesn't go back to eleven as the next value. It goes back to it goes to a thousand and one. So the internal state is actually modified by this. This is important to know because it um, when you're simulating a lot of these things, it will make a difference. Uh, can you explain what it means to have like a value or switch have like a value of like one or something? Yeah. So on um, our FPGA, like in hardware, we're going to have our like switches. We're gonna have ten switches laid out on the board. And when we assign them to pins on the FPGA, like the pins on the FPGA to the ports in our module, we will specify a mapping of those switches to these uh, input ports in our module. So if the input port was 111 followed by a bunch of zeros, it would indicate that the three leftmost switches were, one, one, were all turned on and the remaining seven were turned off. So what we're doing in simulation is we're trying to replicate the behavior of physically moving the switches on an FPGA and seeing what the LEDs do just by looking at the numbers on the screen. Any other questions? Cool. So that's like, those are like the bulk of the features we have as far as simulation goes. So now we'll go back to pin planning and then uh, that should be it, I think. Yeah. Right, Claire? Or no, we, all, we also have them synthesized, don't we? Yeah, we do, okay. So yeah, we'll go ahead and pin plan now, and then you guys will actually get to take out your FPGAs and see if your module works. Yeah, so if some people asked earlier, how does this number really translate to switches on the board? Um, if you go into pin planner or control shift N, uh, first I'm going to make the, um, the top level, the top again, because we're no longer synthesizing. So it says top level entity, and then, in planner. Okay, so this may look complicated, but good news is you don't actually have to worry about it too much. What we want is down here. Um, let's see. Oh, I need to synthesize again. Give me a sec. Yeah, the reason why I only showed up the LEDs earlier is because it's still using the test bench version, which only outputs the LEDs, if you remember. So now we want both switches and LEDs in here. While that happens, um, 
Let's see if he has the pin planner pulled up. Come on. Okay. Okay, so we have attached the pin sheet to the, um, do you have a question? Okay, the pin sheet to lab one. And basically what this is, is it gives you the names of the um, pins to directly to the elements on your FPGA. So you see these uh, two sections, um, nine through 18, those are your switches. And then we have your LEDs down here. And you see that each of these pins have a name and they don't really have a pattern which is why we have this pin sheet for you guys. I'm going back here. Okay, it's done. Hopefully if I open up pin planner, then it will have switches as well. Okay. Um, one thing that you may need to be careful about is that- huh? Yeah, can you repeat how you got the plugs to appear in the pin planner? Right. So when you have your top level module here, um, remember how we specified the inputs and outputs here? That will kind of tell the um, pin planner what it needs. So it needs to know where the switches signals are coming from. It needs to know where the LED signals are going to. And the reason why it wasn't there before is if you remember here, we only specify output of LEDs. So you need to change the top level module. Yes. So if you go into the files menu and right click mini LU top and then set it as top level entity. Which we should... did, yeah update it and then you'll have to analysis and synthesis again mm -hmm. which we did okay one thing to be careful about is you'll notice that the the um arrays go from nine to zero here or the indices um but i believe on the actual sheet if it will open yeah it goes from zero to nine uh i think a solution you can do is to yeah uh click on node name so they're facing the other way. Uh, and then therefore, I think you can just directly copy them from the sheets. So we have LEDs zero through nine and those are here. And so you want to take the pin names and then copy them into your pin planner. Were all of you able to find the pin sheet by the way? Uh, it should be links in the lab spec that we put in dab links. Sorry. Um, I said I said like mini LU top to the top level, but mm -hmm. when I opened the pin planner, it's still not showing. Did you run analysis and synthesis again? Oh, okay. Yeah, you have to do it again. Otherwise, it will just use the the test bench one. Like that's what happened to me. Okay, so we pasted our pins in. Let me do the other ones first. Um. Yeah. So our switches are here. Okay, um, now we, we have this IO standard. If you notice on the sheet, uh, we actually have it marked out for you. So all of these have an IO standard of 3.3 V LVTTL, um, which means 3.3 .3 volts. So we need to change that for every single one. Now I'm trying to remember if there was a faster way to do it or if I actually have to make three. You should can copy this as well. Huh? Can you? Okay. I can't remember. I really hope so. I'm going to try it um, because it's that's nice. slow. Yes, no, it's just... Yeah, I'm just sure it is. Never mind. You have to change all the manual. Okay. Well, this oh, was. Like... Highlight all of them and then change it. I got you. Okay, please. <laughs> Yeah, so you can go and highlight all of these. And then in here, you can change the 3.3 VLVTTL, click the check mark, and then that should update all of them. Thank you. All right, so now we've actually assigned all of our pins. We can go ahead and- Gabriella. Oh. I will walk over there. Continue. OK. OK, so now we've actually set up all of our pins. That's great. Now, how do we actually get this on the FPGA? Uh, I'm not connected to an FPGA right now, but I could probably get one. But in any case, what we want to do is go back to Cordis. 
where is it, Cordis? And we want to hit uh, all the way to um, assembly. And a trick you can do is if you want to run all of them, you can just click on the bottom most one. And this will basically get the Verilog into the FPGA configuration you need to load it onto your FPGA. Is everyone following so far? I heard a no. It's up. Okay, that's really good. Oh, John. Can you show me the, the pin planner again? Yes. Okay, so pin planner, control shift N, and then up here. Uh, but if you're typing these in manually, please don't. Uh, please copy them from the spreadsheet. Otherwise, it takes forever. Uh, but let me leave this up here. Okay, I'm just going to run the last step because it will take you a while to set up the FPG, maybe. But essentially, after you run analysis and synthesis, bidder and assembler, uh, you're going to click on program device. Uh, click on this, hit, and then hit start. And then you'll see now if I switch on a switch, then the, the LED above it will be too. So that's how we know we've succeeded. So this will be the outcome if you guys are able to do it on your own. Uh, but hmm? this LEDs will light up when the switch is in the position. So that's the end of the tutorial part. Uh, thank you for dealing with all of our issues. If you guys still have errors when setting things up, Pam and I are here to help. Uh, but if you need to go, uh, we've kept you here long enough. So thank you for coming. Thank you, guys.